Pitch four. There's loads of money to be made renting unused space. Airbnb, Verbo, PeerSpace, they all take excess capacity and make it available to anyone with a wallet. But what if I told you there's another opportunity hidden in plain sight? Nearly a trillion dollars in valuable real estate that sits empty 70% of the time. That underutilized asset? Local churches. Today's founder, Emmanuel Brown, is building the Airbnb for churches. Now, Emmanuel doesn't want to play God. He just wants to help churches pay the bills. After all, he grew up as a pastor's kid, or PK for those in the biz. He saw exactly how hard running a church can be. Can I get a founder market fit, anyone? Can Emmanuel go from the pulpit to the pitch room and convert our investors? Or will they say, hell no, leaving him in fundraising purgatory? Let's meet the investors. Jillian Manis with Structure Capital. It's literally sat down and I was like, I'm in. Matt Conwell with Rare Breed Ventures. As a unicorn hunter, I want to see every unicorn. Beck Bamberger with Bad Ideas Group. I got to start my muffin business. Real quick, if you're not following the show already, hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. The Pitch for Church Space is coming up after this. Amen. Dun, da, da, da. Perfect timing. Hello. 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 How are you? Hi. Hey, man. Good to see you. Good to meet you. Nice Back. to meet you. So good to meet you. Hello. Are you? Hi, Welcome I'm around. Jillian. Hi, Jillian. So Hi, nice to meet you. pleasure to meet you. So who are we meeting? Emmanuel Brown in Church Space. Church Space? Is it like Peer Space? Similar, yes. Okay, that's one of our Ooh. companies. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm familiar. Yeah. Well, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Well, as you know, I'm Emmanuel Brown, the co-founder of Church Space, and we're the Airbnb for churches. I grew up as a pastor's kid, which, as you can mm. imagine, was really challenging. I mean, let's be honest, who really wants to memorize Bible verses every night before bed or get shipped off to Bible camp every single summer? But in all seriousness, being a pastor's kid was challenging because I witnessed the burden that church real estate became to my parents, who represent mm. one in three church leaders who leave the ministry due to the stress of financial responsibility. And with nearly a trillion dollars that's tied up in the church real estate equity in America, the average church is empty 70% of the week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's nearly half a million of them in this country, and church real estate is the largest untapped and most unexpected commercial real estate supply source in this country. And that's exactly why we built ChurchBase, a two-side marketplace that helps churches turn their underutilized real estate into on-demand space for locals. Over the last 18 months, we've experimented a ton, and we learned that churches are great supply sources for all types of events. But where we really found our secret sauce was by helping churches turn their underutilized commercial-grade kitchens into yes. on-demand space for food entrepreneurs. Now oh. food entrepreneurs huh. can find ways to cost-effectively use space in their community while helping churches to earn $60,000 per year of new revenue that they otherwise would have never seen. Now, this is a massive opportunity. And we have nearly 8,000 customers that have signed up to our platform, and we just released the latest version in Houston, Texas in November. And now we are wrapping up our $1.2 million round to scale to three new markets this year. That's Dallas, Austin, and Atlanta, and to hire the Rockstar team to help fuel that growth. You said the round off the 1.2, how much of that do you have committed so far? 60, 60% 60 of it. Okay. Oh, okay. And what are the terms for that? It's a uh, 8 million post. Mm -hmm. hmm. So you mentioned that you had 8,000 signups. And sign not ups. churches, Correct. specifically users. users yeah. who for how many churches? churches? Yeah, so we have about 350 time. churches that have signed up to the platform. Okay. But we recently closed a large denominational partnership to add 1,200 churches to the platform this oh, year. Smart. So that's one of our go and market strategies is by working with what is called denominations. These are large umbrella church networks that house dozens, hundreds, or thousands of churches hmm. under one denomination. So is hmm. that similar to a mega church? No, it's not. So a mega church is a large individual church. Okay. Uh, a denomination 
essentially is a faith organization. A franchise. A franchise. Yeah. You Correct. can partner with them and get to all of the churches. Exactly. So which religions encompass this? Christian? Yeah. So right Catholic. now we're focusing on Christianity. Christianity. Specifically, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. about half a million in this country. We're laser focused on that vertical because that's mm-hmm. what we know best. Yeah. I mean, faith ecosystems are completely relational, right? Yeah. So yeah. our network, connecting with them, establishing that trust, that's how we win as Pastor's Kid. My co-founder is also a Pastor's Kid as well. So I get the understanding of the real estate being totally underutilized. Yes, yes absolutely, from the church perspective. But what are the other demographics of who would use this? A food entrepreneur, but mm. I'm assuming that's a small thing. So who else? Yeah, so there's almost about half a million food entrepreneurs okay. in this country. But we've helped churches share their space for weddings, funeral. I mean, the funeral Event. industry is recession-proof, right? Like that's, that's never right. that's never going to stop. Death is always. We've seen corporate conferences, local community gatherings. Yeah, I mean, churches have these large well, auditoriums. Yeah, yeah, exactly. they're and huge. Stages. Yeah, stages. and stages. Hmm. The secret sauce is they come with built-in audiovisual yeah, capabilities as well, right? So it's yeah. very turnkey in that sense. Uh, we've helped churches share their parking lots. Uh, so this is really hmm. a large opportunity when we start to think about all the different space types that exist under one facility. And we really believe in local utility. How can we dream with assets that already exist in our community? Yeah. And we're leaning heavily into that community-led growth. So one of the fixed advantages that we have is the churches we work with have a membership size of about 50 to 250 people in the church who can become brand evangelists, no pun intended, yeah. and carry on that mm-hmm. mission that is not only beneficial for the church, but for the community that they're a part of. So how do you deal with insurance? Mm. That, um, what does the church, what policies cover? Um, what do you cover? So I'll zoom out to talk about why this is the best time to build this business. So there was a huge mindset shift during the pandemic for churches across the world, but specifically here in America, because they could not use their buildings. Right. So mm-hmm. it was a cash drain for about two years where pastors yep. started to think about how do we utilize this space in a way that serves the core purpose of why we exist in the community and can also help to offset some of the costs. Churches are now really leaning into this idea of sharing their buildings in more progressive ways, which we're really excited about. Hmm. But some of the limitations are no different than how a pure space host or Airbnb host may set their home, their house rules. Mm-hmm. No smoking inside. Some churches on our platform do permit alcohol and wine. Some don't. In terms of insurance policies that churches have, it covers basically any event use because churches have people coming into their space mm-hmm. all the time for events. We took a page out of Pure Space's book and we partnered with Thimble oh, as good. well oh, uh, for insurance for the users. So good. we have kind of a 360 uh, insurance right. coverage plan there. Users opt into Thimble on that end and churches have their policy that covers them on their on their end as well. Tell us a little bit about your business model. Yeah. How do you make money? Oh, uh, so- I don't want to know that. Come on. <laughs> God, Mac, you're so invasive. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. At the moment, it's a simple take rate of 20%. Yep. We learned that that's a little bit low. Churches mm. churches are actually willing to allow for our take rate to be 25%, oh. which is a little bit higher than the market standard. Typically, yeah. But we're also experimenting with a new business model with the food entrepreneurs that we've learned based on data that we collect, which is a subscription model allowing food entrepreneurs to use it like a hot desk. So they'll use a kitchen in North Houston today or this week, and next week they'll use another in-network kitchen in South Houston. They can go to Austin for Mm. South by Southwest and be connected to the church-based kitchen network in that sense. So you mentioned your take rate right now is 20%, but go as high as 25. What's the average value of one of these transactions? Yeah, so there are two different types of transactions. Mm -hmm. There are recurring transactions that happen on our platform, and that ranges really anywhere between 2,500 to 3,000 a month. That can be a brand new, smaller church who's renting space from an established church uh, that's renting on a recurring Mm. basis. And then for one-time users, the average order transaction is between $150 to $200 per hour. So you said you got 350 churches so far. You're raising 1.2 million round. You have 60% of that raise. There's yes. 8 million customers who have said, hey, I intend. 8, uh, like 8, if thousand. there's 8 million customers, exactly. I would not be here 8 today. 8 million posts. <laughs> right. um, what have you made so far? Yeah, so in 2023, we just closed yeah. with 150K of gross revenue. Okay. And what's your burn? 30,000 a month. And how many is team members? We have an amazing team of seven folks. Uh, We actually just hired two new people last week. Um, My co-founder, her background is in PR and marketing, uh, branding, which is essential for a marketplace. She owned and operated a PR firm. Her and I actually have a small exit together from a project that we worked on prior to Church Space 
called Church Based TV, which in the beginning of the really? pandemic, we pivoted Church Based to become oh, a yeah. streaming platform. Oh, yes. And we sold that to a small production company in Houston, Texas. That's cool. And myself, uh, my background is in startups. For about the last eight years, I've worked in uh, a biz dev and ops um, capacity at various startups. And the last startup I worked with was acquired in 2019. Which one? Uh, it's called Black Lapel. It's a menswear. Yeah, um, that's cool. Yep. You mentioned you have 30K burn. What's your runway? About eight months right now. So we have about 250K in the bank. Nice. What's the exit for this? So there's a lot of white space in this category uh, with church real estate, mm -hmm. and we know that we can own it. One potential exit strategy, honestly, I know Pure Space has a few churches on their platform. They do. Uh, but they're really focused on creative usage of space. Right. And we mm -hmm. think um, an acquisition from them could be a great exit strategy for us to add another element of supply to their platform. Uh, also, there are faith-based PE funds that are really interested in what we're building. And we huh. think that could be a potential exit strategy for us hmm. down the road. Hmm. Interesting business model. Hmm. Really smart. Marketplace makes tons of sense. How you make this a billion dollar business? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a ton of cross pollination that's going to happen between churches and food and events. And we believe that we can not only disrupt the ghost kitchen industry, but the small events market and make churches the physical home for all community flourishing, where people work, eat, play out of their local church. That's how we become a billion dollar business. We also need to have uh, about 500 churches or more on the platform who are active and all hitting that 60K or more threshold. That's to get to a point where we feel like we can be acquired. To get to the billion dollar status, we need 35,000 churches on the platform. So you said there's 1.5 million of these food entrepreneurs? I said about half a million. Half about a half a million. Yeah, about half, half a million. million. Okay, half a million. So that cons uh, concerns me a little bit because then I'm thinking mm. like, what all percentage? right, it's you know it's half a million, and what percentage of those will go to one of the cities that you have that is yeah. also like cool? I want to go to a church, you know, instead of doing it in my own home. And so I'm I'm a little bit stuck on that just because I'm thinking from there's almost needing to be I would think like mm. a little bit of a a kick in the culture, a TV show on Netflix or something for people, another bear, you know, with <laughs> on HBO or something for people to be like. I got to start my muffin business. Yes. Mm. And I need to go to this church to find and build my, you know, something, I, think, I don't know if it's an, hot enough. I okay. think the better question is, so you, you identify these right. food entrepreneurs, but what are the other top two or three other users that you see that use your platform for these churches? Yep. Uh, what we call internally church to church rentals. So there are thousands yes. of church planting networks. These are churches that are just starting out yes. and they need a physical place to go. Mm -hmm. They have a congregation, they have membership, they don't have a building. That's one. It's right. also recurring revenue, does very right. well for us. True. We don't have to spend much to any marketing on How that. How many of those are there? There are about 5,000 or more of them that exist in the United States. Okay. Beyond that, small events industry, right? So weddings, funerals birthday parties, baptisms, things like that. Mm -hmm. And if you were doing a pie chart, yeah. right, what percentage would be church to church, what percentage mm. would be food, and what percentage would be the events? I think church to church is going to be the largest percentage of that pie just because okay. there is so much natural connectivity and adjacency for a church to want to use another church to get sure. their ministry started. But then we believe after that, food entrepreneurship can be the next big category for right. us, and then events. So correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understand, the church congregations are shrinking exponentially. I was just going to get on this. Like, that's going down. Is the that's okay, going, keep going down. Keep going. Yes, yes. I'm just wondering hmm. if church to church should be your primary market because that is a shrinking market. Emmanuel's Case for Faith, coming up after this. Welcome to church, friends. We're so glad you decided to spend a part of your weekend with us. Before our service continues, go ahead and greet your neighbor. Then have a seat and prepare for today's message from Brother Emmanuel. I'm just wondering hmm. if church to church should be your primary market 
because that is a shrinking market. So let me clarify. Statistically, there are more Gen Zs that have converted to Christianity than there have been millennials and the prior generation. Oh, so a it's a little bit of a myth uh, in America thing, right? that faith is desecrating. Uh, God is up and to the right. Hockey stick growth. The Gen Z Christian community on TikTok is huge. Big, yes. It's huge, of right? Of course. But let me tell you a story. So I was uh, in Houston, Texas, visiting one of our host churches, and I was hungry and was looking for a place to stop for lunch. I literally drove around the corner and found a food truck park. Yes. I stopped at that food truck park, and I ordered some great Jamaican food, oxtail, rice and peas. It was amazing. Mm. But I spoke to all the food entrepreneurs. Oh, yeah. And by law, they need a commercial kitchen to be connected to. And I asked them, like, where do you where guys you connect? How, how do you find that? Oh. And they had no clue anywhere in the area that was close by. And this okay. church was around the corner with a commercial kitchen. So talk about local utility and being able to unlock value for our customers in the real way. Okay. That, okay. that industry has grown by oh, 30% compound kidding? annual growth rate. I didn't know rate. they had to have a commercial kitchen. Yeah, yeah. My question is on defensibility. Sure. Obviously, we got the pastor's children. Yeah. We got that aspect. That's good. That's good God for the story. Coverage. God is covered Infallible. on the PR front. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is good. Um, but how deep is the moat of the defensibility sure. here? So, so the moat goes deep, and, and where it goes deep is uh, we spent about the first 12 months of our business in heavy R&D mm -hmm. around churches as nonprofits generating extra income. Can yeah. be a little bit of a gray area depending tax on tax-wise. And... Tax mm -hmm. So we built in what we call our IRS safeguarding tool into the platform that helps churches to navigate those challenges. Hmm. A lot of times churches are eager to earn the extra revenue beyond a certain point there are real concerns about what do I do with all this extra cash we just made, and our platform helps to solve that issue for them. Uh, so it helps to create a stickiness and, and mm. brand loyalty. They don't want to go to another platform potentially to, to run that risk, uh, but also we spent a lot of time with nonprofit lawyers figuring that issue out. Uh, so we feel like we have a head start in, in that regard too. Beck, what do you think here? I think this sounds like a bad idea, which I like. You yes. know, it's a, it's a bad idea. I'm, I'm I'm not in the faith space, but sure. I like the connectivity of this of the utilization of space mm. in these various markets and in the creation, I, I think the bigger why here is a little bit more in the creation. Imagine if your local community yes. is able to hire seven more people yes. or able to start these seven businesses. So as I'm thinking about it, it's like, oh, imagine the headline of like, mm. this cookie company started in a church basement out of a yeah. kitchen, and yeah. now they're a billion-dollar cookie company or yeah. something that is similar to what, of course, what we work used to be is like, hey, yes. all these small companies were built inside. So I'm liking that. I'm selling myself on it a little bit. I love that. So why mm. couldn't Peer Space just do this themselves? Because they do have a number of churches already on the platform. I mentioned it earlier, faith communities are relational. You have to have, to scale in okay. this yeah. industry, okay. you have to have trust. You have to have credibility. You have to have skin in the game. Okay. Maybe you can get a handful of churches on a one-off basis, but to get into denominations, and that's where the real money is, yeah. so I agree. you have to know I people. Do they want to spend time doing that? Exactly. Well, they'd have to hire a pastor's child. And I'm, I'm hard-pressed to believe that there's anyone out there that's more passionate about this than Aww. I am. I, I can tell. Why are you so passionate about it? Yeah, so, so for two reasons. Gr growing up, uh, my parents had to make some really challenging financial yeah. decisions uh, mm -hmm. around family life, church, building costs. Uh, and eventually they, for a season of their life, ended up stepping away from what their passion was, mm -hmm. uh, which was helping people. Mm -hmm. um, my co-founder, her and I connected around similar origin stories. After her mom acquired her church building in Houston, Texas, she was a pioneer in Houston, Texas. She was one of the first women church leaders on the radio. Mm -hmm. She acquired her church building. Recently after that, her parents got divorced, which is not all too unfamiliar in mm -hmm. this scenario. Uh, her family downsized from a six-bedroom house to a two-bedroom apartment for her family of six, and her mom then passed away because of the stress of all yeah. that stuff that happened, and the origin and root of that was the church building. Um, so I want to solve that. There's also uh, a large mental health crisis amongst pastors mm -hmm. that is kept behind closed doors, okay. and they're supposed to be the beacon of hope that yeah. other people lean into in their times of distress, and they don't have anyone a lot of times. 
What's the smallest check you're going to take? Like 25K? 25K. I'm in for 25K. Can we make that 50? <laughs> let's do diligence and let's do, <laughs> okay. let's do that. Okay. And the reason I am, I am, it is a bad idea. And, you know, I'm bad ideas over here. So I like you a lot. Thank you. The story is very clear. The passion is clear. The size of the market is huge. I yeah. want to gather up more intel on what you pointed to, Julian, because this is my lack of education of going like, is actually church going on the rise? Is there that third market that you're mm. talking about of the church of the churches? Yeah. I also want to dig a little bit more into the food utilization sure. space because, again, if there could just be like a Netflix show or a something that could mm. maybe jettison that further, that's in. But yes, I'm okay. excited. Awesome. We're excited too. Thank you. I'm right now in for 50. Okay. okay. I could go up from there, yeah. truthfully. Sure. But my heart is saying, come into this. Mm. And so right now my heart is leading the way, but then my head will follow yes. on. Yes. Yes. Okay. Sense. Yes. Okay. Very clear about that. Thank you. Fantastic. Jillian. And I do have to clear with peer space yes, that this understand. is not a conflict. Yep. Okay. That makes total sense. Okay. Yeah. I want to get to know you. That's uh, you like, seem like a dope person. Thanks, Mac. Uh, and people I know and think very highly of think very highly of you. Thank you. I think you've built a very intriguing business. Um, but due to m my faith and the way I've looked at like faith-based investments, mm. I've stayed away from it. Yeah. Just, that's the thing. Uh, it's a no for me because like I tend to stay away from the space. Sure, it makes sense. But I do want to get to know you. Let's do it. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, you all so, so much. much. Thank you. Thanks for a great conversation. No, thank this you. was so lovely, it. Emmanuel. I love your mission. Thank you. And I'm very excited that that Beck's involved. Yes. Hey, okay. we're we need to do some Beck, work on this. Yeah. This is a TV show. Come on. This what? is the oh, church. This? Oh. The faith-based audience is yes. so huge. I was in the publishing industry for a time. <laughs> recession proof. And the number yeah. one recession books proof. are always faith-based books. Yeah. There's a, that's mm. it. The thing I kept thinking about is, if you work with these churches, that means you get a connection to the congregation. Right. Every church congregation has local business leaders. Yes. I do love where there's like such a deep connective fiber to a certain audience. So if you get in with one, mm -hmm. yeah. you get in with one of your 1,200 congregation, you're easily sold to the five next because yeah, right. they're so all super connected. Congregation is a sales and recruiting. Exactly. The, I like the cyclical element of this. Oh, how do we get that new rec room? Oh, what? Oh, yeah. we did it through that. We're going to oh, rent yeah. out our kitchen. We want to keep doing that. Let's yeah. not. Let's make yeah. sure we market this. Yeah. Hey, you want to be a food entrepreneur? Yes, you yes. do. Come and pay us. I yeah. love bucks a month. Like, for a lot of the larger something... churches, at oh. the end of their service, they do their updates. Yeah. They talk about community events. Absolutely. They talk about things happening at church. Yeah. Right. Mine does. It wouldn't be much for a church to be like, oh, and just announce, you know, as we're getting ready to kick we're off on church space. The, the building campaign. of our next building yes. or whatever campaign, we're going to be using church space. So if you see people here using it, if you would like to use it. Yeah. You're granted, like I said, this is my entrepreneur brain. This is where like me yeah. as the investor, like, oh, if I was running a company, I would do it. The founder never said that. So that doesn't mean the founder wants to do that or would do that. Isn't it wild? Some of the most priceless real estate in America is caught sure. up in these churches. Do you know the portfolio that the Scientology, Church oh. of Scientology oh. has? Oh. Okay, that was one of my uncomfortable experiences. Tell no me about offense it. to anybody who's in Scientology. And they run you a little film. And they it's like Dr. the creme de la creme of the top real estate in the world. I was like, oh my, yeah. oh my I, God. Wait, wait, and the Mormon. Oh, another phenomenal real estate. I love group. Mormons. They're so, so industrious. Stop! Before anyone says anything sacrilegious, let's recap. Beck and Jillian both made commitments in the room. So, they decided to start a small group together. A due diligence small group. At the first meeting, they had full attendance. But, after checking with Peerspace, her portfolio company, Jillian had to back out of the deal. But Beck could still be a believer in this business. Lisa and I caught up with Emmanuel to hear what happened next. Emmanuel, hello. Hey, Josh. It's been 40 days and 40 nights since you pitched on the show. What you been up to? Um, it's definitely <laughs> been a, a, a Red Sea journey. If you will. 
to say the least, you know, some miraculous things are happening. The, the seas are opening up, the skies are splitting, and church base is on its way to the top. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we heard the news that Jillian is conflicted out because of Pierce Base, which is a bummer. Correct. But I'd love to hear what happened after the show with Beck. Yeah, so, so we were connected via email. We hopped on a diligence call where we took a, a dive deeper into the business and to the model and the overall vision and how we get there. We had a great conversation about the potential to improve our brand and take it to the next level. And we think Beck, Beck brings a lot of value to us in, in that regard. So I said I was in for the 25K. I'm going to stay consistent with that. Um, give me, I'm traveling this week and so forth, but I want to come back to you by like Friday, let's say, and we'll take it from here. Uh, after that diligence call, it was a few days in between where Beck took to mull it over and think it over. She followed up with us with an email and the green light that she was very excited to make the investment into church base. And from there, she wired the cash pretty quickly and we were off to the races. Nice. And did she end up investing the 25K? She did. That's awesome. Well, congrats. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. you got another investor on the team. I know. We're really excited about that. Uh, I think she brings a wealth of experience. So we're, we're excited for what Beck can add to the team. Yeah. Tell me about the round overall. I think on hmm. the show, you mentioned that you'd raised 720000 of your $1.2 million goal. Yeah. So we're at seven fifty to date. And that doesn't include Beck's investment. And we're very excited because we're in diligence with a couple of funds that have committed some more capital. So we anticipate for the round to kind of have a red bow tied around it in the next few weeks and months ahead. So by Q2, we'll be ready to scale to a couple of new markets by the end of the year. Cool. So on the show, Max said, I think you've built a very intriguing business, but mm -hmm. due to my faith, and the way I've looked at faith-based investments, I've stayed away from it. Is that type of sentiment something you hear often from VCs? Honestly, no. And, and I appreciate Max candor there. Huh. But I wouldn't be surprised if that was sometimes an underlying reason why VCs who have passed on us did pass. Yeah. I think faith can be a polarizing topic, and that's why we couldn't be more excited about what we're building, because in a sense, church base and the platform is the bridge between church and community and people who may be agnostic to the faith or don't ha want anything to do with the faith. Right. And that's why we're positioning ourselves around this commercial kitchen opportunity, because it's solely about the utility and positioning the church in such a way that they can equitably give back to the community in a way where it feels like there's no strings attached. And you, ha you don't have to believe what we believe, but we do want to share what we have with you. And that's what we believe is really important to us. Yeah. Have you run into people who, on the opposite end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. are investing because it is a faith-based company versus strictly capitalism reasons? Yeah, absolutely. There is a whole ecosystem of faith-driven investors who invest based on their faith and their investment thesis and perspectives are totally oriented around what they believe. And we have some of those on our cap table and we're really excited about that. Does it matter to you what perspective they come as an investor, like whether they bring faith to it or whether they come in without faith, but curious to be a part of the business? Yeah, you, you know you know what, Josh? There, there are people who have faith and there are those who don't have faith. And both of those types of individuals can have ulterior motives. So what, <laughs> sure. what really yeah. matters to us the most is that the individual aligns with the overall mission of the business, which is to get churches and communities connected to transform real estate that's underutilized mm -hmm. and to really build the community from within. I think that's what we really believe in the most at church base is that community development doesn't start from the outside. It doesn't start by bringing a whole bunch of real estate developers from outside of the community to make decisions and to put up really tall, big buildings and say, hey, we've created something nice and beautiful for you, use it. But it starts with the resources and the people who are already there and figuring out intuitive, and unique ways to take the things that have been overlooked and beautify them and make them available for people in, in a simple way. 
who doesn't want their community to flourish? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, exactly. If you don't want your community to flourish, what's wrong with you? <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's really helpful. And I imagine it's nice to have a mix of people from all different backgrounds on the cap table. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, Emmanuel, I don't know if you know this about me, but I also was a PK. <gasps> I did know that. But. Was, that was that a fake laugh? <laughs> I did know that about you. You mentioned briefly on the show that there's a mental health crisis for pastors. Mm. And nobody talks about it because, well, actually, I'm curious why you think people don't talk about it. Mental health is a hard thing to talk about in general. Right. Specifically in the church, it's been stigmatized. And I think it's hard for a pastor um, for a lot of different reasons to say, I need help. One of those primary reasons is who's supposed to help the pastor when the pastor is the one who helps everyone else. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of silent suffering amongst church leaders. Uh, I think the pastor has a lot of jobs within the church. One is people management, leadership, to be a great orator, to manage church finances and operations. And a lot of times it's a one person show. It sounds like um, you're describing a startup founder right now. <laughs> it is, yeah. I mean, that's exactly what a, a, a pastor is. You have to figure out all of these components and how to grow your church. And it's the same thing in a lot of ways that we're doing in the startup world. How do I get customers or people to come and to donate and to fundraise? Yeah. The pastors who are thriving in today's society are the ones who have a keen entrepreneurial gene. Like they're really sharp. Really? When it comes, yeah, when it comes to having an entrepreneurial spirit, those are the pastors that are doing really well. They're thinking outside the box. Right. They're, being they're really innovative. focused on conversions. Yes, they're focused on <laughs> conversion rates. <laughs> they are, they're, they're focused exclusively on conversion. Uh, but they're pushing the envelope in some really cool ways. And pastors that have this entrepreneurial spirit not only perform well on our platform, but are performing well in the community. What kind of things do you think founders could learn from pastors in running their companies? There's a lot of things founders can learn from pastors, but one of them, because pastors inherently are playing the long game. They're looking at everything with an eternal perspective, yeah. or at least they should be. And I think as founders, it, it's important to stay in the weeds and stay really closely connected to what you're building and what you're solving today. But building with the end in mind is so important. And it helps you stay motivated and it helps you remember why you wake up every day and you do what you do. Milestones are important and closing your round is important. But staying authentic to your mission is the most important thing. Anything the other way around that pastors could learn from startup founders? Yeah, be a bit more scrappy in the sense that it's okay to throw things at the wall and see what sticks sometimes. Mm. It, it's okay to operate out of the traditional mode that they've operated in for a long time. Be iterative in their approach and be scrappy. I like that. Thanks. Emmanuel, thank you so much for spending the time with us, coming out and pitching on our show in Miami. And uh, congratulations on raising 825000 of your round. Thank you. I was expecting you to correct me on my math. <laughs> I, I, no. <laughs> it took me a moment to, for it to register, and now I was going to say, hey, Josh, what do you mean by 825000 <laughs> Yeah, uh, Yeah, I'm glad you asked, Emmanuel. Uh, <laughs> the pitch fund is going to be following on, on, on this investment, so oh, we'd love man. to invest 50 k if you'll have us. I would love to. This is so exciting. I love what you guys are doing. I think you and Lisa and the whole pitch team are phenomenal. And Josh, just as a pastor's kid, it means a lot from, from one PK to another. So, mm -hmm. so thank you. Yeah, just two hurting people just trying to connect, <laughs> yeah, make listen, our way through the world. I, I have a, a great therapist for all the PKs who are still <laughs> processing. Oh, actually, what yes. What the heck is, I need, what is I going need on that. in life? <laughs> he needs it. Give him that. <laughs> We're not. I'm, yeah, I'm serious. <laughs> Maybe that's our next startup, Josh. Is the <laughs> <laughs> therapist for pastors' kids? Exactly. I mean, talk about a niche market. <laughs> yeah. This concludes our service. If you're an investor looking for alpha 
and Omega in your portfolio, you can join our congregation. I mean, the Pitch Fund. But seriously, if you'd like to learn more about the fund, you can go to thepitch.fund. And if you're a founder looking for that sweet mana from VC heaven, aka money, or moolah, cheddar, cheese, we want to hear from you. We're talking to founders right now for our next big pitch event in June. Our best VC panel ever has already signed on for another season. Now we just need you. Go to pitch.show slash apply and upload your pitch deck or deal memo. All these links are in the show description as well. Next week on The Pitch, it's tween time. We're redefining feminine hygiene for tweens. You've done five million sales. You did three million yet last year. Very impressive. Thank you. I really believe in this category. I'm an investor in a company called Amp Float. And similarly, I'm a personal investor in Ruby Love. Like Elizabeth and Charles, I have seen a lot of these companies. Mm-hmm. I've never made an investment in the space. You should be raising more than 500000 As a black woman, for me to come on here and say, I'm going to become the new always, that's super yes. audacious. And I could, we could we, like for it. sure. What makes it audacious? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. That's what I wanted to hear. I get the sense back her experience might have been a little different. <laughs> That looks really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Next week on The Pitch, Monica Williams drops the mic. Hit that subscribe button right now and turn on notifications so you don't miss it. This episode was made by me, Josh Muccio, Lisa Muccio, Anna Ladd, Enoch Kim, and Alma Langshaw with casting help from Peter Liu and John Alvarez. Music in this episode is by The Muse Maker, Boxwood Orchestra, The Crashing, Our Many Stars, Indigo Jewel, Snivers, and First Sticks. If you loved our uncut pitch last season, you're in luck. You can listen to all of season 11 uncut over on our new Patreon. We dropped the entire season early. And you can get into heated debates about it with other listeners in our brand new group chat. Check it out at patreon.com slash the pitch. The pitch is made in partnership with the Vox Media Podcast Network. Was that a holy take? The Pitch Inc. and their respective employees and affiliates do not provide investment advice or make investment recommendations. The information provided on this show should not be used as the basis for making investment decisions. Listeners should conduct their own research and consult with their own investment advisors before making any investment decisions.